My talk is uh, Reflections from Great Britain in Time of Pandemic. Well, we have been for almost a year now, locked up, locked in, and locked out of so much. I wonder what wisdom there might be to help us consider how to redirect those negatives to a more positive view of how the experience can be shifted somewhat to make it more of a locked and loaded reality. Exchanging the ubiquitous negatives, that is, for a more positive experience and a more hopeful attitude. My first reaction on hearing in the United Kingdom in March of 2020, that faced with alarming rises in morbidity from COVID-19, we were to be put into a strict national lockdown. My reaction was to go downstairs to the library and root around for an Albert Camus novel set in French colonial North Africa titled The Plague. It is still a notable book and worth reading for the play it makes between varying Christian views and existentialist positions about different reactions to death in a quarantine town suffering a deadly infection just after the Second World War. But the main weight of a Christian theology of how providence works in times of suffering was carried in that novel by an old Catholic priest whom the author weighs down with rigid scholastic attitudes, attributable to post-war Catholicism, which Camus likes to contrast with what he seems to regard as the more honest position of the in-moment existentialist bewilderment, out from which, with a certain heroic endeavor, his protagonist hero, the doctor, can still hope to exercise human kindness in times of great stress. Camus' priest wants his flock to accept what befalls them as the hand of God manifest and to be sure to die well. He works tirelessly among the people, as does the town doctor, who, without any visible commitment to a particular metaphysic, selfly expends himself to track and halt the progress of the infection. Of course, if you set the polarities in this way, then the active existentialist is bound to appear more cool. It is not that the old priest is not as active and charitable in his own way, courageously visiting the sick, but that he seems more passive and death accepting in the face of the troubles. In a more sophisticated way, to be sure. The way Camus has set his puzzle of considering theodicy is reminiscent of the old football that has been kicked around the debates on providence in times of suffering from antiquity onwards. Voltaire's caustic critique in Candide of the philosopher Leibniz's annoyingly cheery hope in the aftermath of the great earthquake of Lisbon was sketched out in his ridiculous figure of Pangloss. But Voltaire gives the final word in his book to the once innocent but now world-wearied figure of Candide himself, who having rescued his other companions from varying degrees of life disaster, puts a finger onto Pangloss's lips just as he is about to theorize on what all this suffering could possibly mean. Candide tells him, no, we must cultivate the garden. Il faut cultiver le jardin. And this somewhat stoic existentialism is quite right in its own way, because winter was coming, and unless that little company, rescued from the shipwreck of their former hopes, could get out in time to dig and plant and harvest, then there would be no food coming for the springtime. But Candide has certainly become the patron saint of our age. Santayana once wrote, skepticism is the chastity of the intellect. To which the Anglican theologian Harry Williams hilariously replied that this being the case, then our present generation is, quote, well on the way to being an uptight old maid. So what if we were, first of all, to accept the practical wisdom of the existentialists and agree that our immediate responses to pandemic crisis would be to follow the science and find the appropriate best actions for the good. 
Who could possibly object to that? I have in my text rhetorical pause. Following the science would be to do our best in honoring those who work for the welfare of their brothers and sisters in times of trouble. Such an attitude would surely be a wise form of obedience, not only to authorities duly constituted by law, but also to those constituted as such by their skill sets, and ultimately, from a theological perspective, obedience to logos. And so this is a first notable thing in what I have observed in some American and British reactions to the pandemic, namely that unreason has tried to masquerade as wisdom. In your country, you've had many who have denigrated the professionals and advocated everything from drinking bleach to taking massive doses of vitamin D, but who regarded hand washing and mask wearing as part of some nefarious conspiracy. In our country, we've had a rash of internet commentators insinuating that the government has made all of this up in order to impose greater controls on the population. Doubtless, the same set will also refuse any vaccine as being a mind control subterfuge. But idiocy, when extrapolated beyond mere simple mindedness, is a character of the forces that work against the kingdom of God. In short, it is evil, not funny sad, and needs to be exposed as pernicious rather than tolerantly laughed off. It is even sadder to see some parts of the orthodox world, albeit the backwoodsman parts of it, arguing in a recent synodical epistle that infections cannot be caught in the context of the Eucharist. So whether it is in the secular world or in the cloisters, it is idiocy ought to be held up as an enemy of truth. Unreason is a defiance of the Logos. And as Origen taught us, we must go oppo Logos Agi, that is, follow wheresoever the Logos leads us. In this case, as in most others, we have a religious duty to follow the science. Such obedience will be obedience to the divine Logos too, and thus will manifest the virtues of the kingdom among us. Educated civic responsibility in such circumstances simply becomes part of our religious duty. But as orthodox, Honoring the science does not mean that science will be our beginning and our end, our only leader or our only hope, as often seems to be the implication of those who have learned to approach their science only from the standpoint of empirical reductionism. Science is our tool, and it does not banish metaphysics as Voltaire imagined, and as many reductionists today presume. It is not contrary to but one of the fundamental aspects of our present metaphysics, a medium of analysis on the path towards the truth. It is part of the manifestation of the pattern of truth, not a substitute for it. So again, as orthodox, in this time of trouble, we are also being called upon to reflect on the larger issues of metaphysical meaning caused by this time of pandemic. And this, I think, is an equally challenging task to that pressing upon us when we seek to consider practical solutions. In our spiritual consciousness, we are called on here to discern the meaning signaled in portentous events. It is what the Lord called reading the signs of the times. In such cases, an inability to discern was not regarded as a neutral or even a heroic thing like the agnostic activism of the good doctor in Camus' novel, but rather is regarded as a damaging lack of spiritual discernment, one which Jesus himself criticized on the part of his contemporaries, noting how that they could easily read the weather, but were deaf and blind to the voice and finger of God among them. I have been struck in England 
which I once thought was a deeply secularized country, but now having come to live in it, regard as an extensively paganized one, by how little we have heard about spiritual resources in time of health crisis. No word has emanated, or should I say, has been allowed to be heard through the channels of the British media about spirituality from our numerous archbishops. The Archbishop of Canterbury, at first, even forbade his priests from entering their own churches after having forbidden any other congregants to do so alongside him. A most peculiar position, it might be thought. The Orthodox clergy in England simply continued to celebrate the liturgy with the priest and one cantor suitably distant. We have long known that every liturgy has the selfsame task of lifting up all the people and all the towns and the villages of the world along with the one who offers and is offered. And so even when large numbers cannot be present, they are still made present in the sacred mysteries. This has been for me as a locked up priest, a wonderful aspect of welcoming the king of all invisibly escorted by angelic hosts into this little seaside town where I live. The one notable exception to hearing words of spiritual comfort from anybody in England was the evening of the announced first lockdown in March 2020, when the Queen made a rare public broadcast to tell her people that there will be times of joy after the present moment of distress. And in the course of her message of hope, she suggested that the period of closure in one's house might even be a chance for people to find a new focus in prayer. It had a touching effect on me, coming as it did so unexpectedly in a wilderness of media wise guys who had nothing to say other than a flurry of criticism of whoever it was in the government was doing anything at any given time. What expertise is self-assumed by television's pan-epistemic commentators? And yet, what a wilderness of heart wisdom, what a dearth of spiritual fathers and mothers. We have had so many experts telling us to wash our hands, to wear masks, to do exercise at home, to knit, to whittle scale models of the Taj Mahal out of fence posts, all of it surely good and part of Voltaire's cultivating the garden practicality. But where was the flood of spiritual advice or metaphysical reflection? I personally would have settled for a trickle, never mind the flood, but none came. I felt like the protagonist in Walter de la Mer's poem. Is there anybody there, said the traveler, knocking at the moonlit door. But considering my own increasing grumpiness at the empty gurus that have been thrown up at me, I also felt challenged to offer, perhaps in these remarks, as if a few moments could tell the story, what could have been the message to the nation, courtesy of the little orthodox community in England. And that is a challenge I would also like to offer to you today as an exercise of comparable utility for your own situations. What would we say? What should we say? How would we phrase the message? Well, like Caesar's goal, my talk is divided into three parts, New Testament, patristic, and pastoral. So not everything I would say to an intelligent, spiritual, and reflective audience such as yourselves would I say, of course, to a national audience? Was it not the Lord himself who gave us the memo about pearls and swine? But here are some graded remarks under those three categories. You can decide for yourselves whether they are pearls or merely pigs will. I am very interested whenever I find in the New Testament a little ray of light that illumines for me the spiritual meditation of Jesus. I don't mean his teachings, rather the times when he has been evidently reflecting on scripture in a more personal way. One such 
was the moment when he ordered his disciples not to resist the troops that came to arrest him in Gethsemane. He reminded them that he was protected by a battalion of angels present at his asking. He clearly had realized earlier at table that Judas had slipped away to betray the address of their lodgings in Bethany so that the police could come in the dead of night, as is their wont, and arrest the entirety of the movement. Gethsemane is located on the crossroads exiting Jerusalem. And this is why Jesus prayed for so long there, seeking to discern whether there was any way, other than disobedience to his mission, that he could reduce his danger. Gethsemane is also the highest vantage point on the Kidron Valley Road, and any detachment of guards coming from the city would be easily visible from a long way off. This is also why he asked his disciples to keep watch. But well into the early hours of the morning, after a long wine fest, Jesus was still praying and they fell asleep. So when the gods did arrive, he alone heard them. When it was too late to do anything other than rouse his company and tell them to run for it. Meanwhile, he himself went out through the narrow gate to meet the police on the street and so confuse them, giving sufficient time for his apostles' escape. And not one of them was captured. It was one of his last mortal acts of kindness. But why tell this tale, which is so well known, but maybe not so well understood? Well, for two reasons. We remember that only a few days before, when entering the dangerous city of Jerusalem, Jesus commanded his disciples to be ready to take up their cross and follow him. A hard saying about embracing suffering that must have greatly frightened them. But at the moment of test, that moment, when he was faced with arrest and the doom he had already foreseen, he made sure that not one of his friends suffered for his sake. He vetoed for them the possibility of taking up their cross, which he had commanded them to do. So first and foremost, we need to remember how subtle and complicated Jesus was and not be wooden in our literal reading. But secondly, I want to go back to what I said earlier about episodes that reveal the inner spirit of Jesus. For the fact that he told them how God had established protective angels shows exactly what he had been praying over for so long in the garden, namely Psalm 90. He will save you from the fowler's snare. No disaster will come near you, for he will command his angels to guard you lest you strike your foot against a stone. This text was understood by Jesus and has been so understood by all subsequent Christianity to apply to the Messiah. And from this we conclude that Jesus' acceptance of torture and unjust execution, largely in that practical here and now rush in order to save his friends from the same fate, was exactly how he personally understood that his father would never allow him, quote, to strike his foot against a stone, but that the angels would rush to his support. Now consider this, for it is, of course, a deep paradox. It is one that I have meditated on each night for many years since that psalm is appointed for Compline in our church. It expresses the theology that providence is not a mechanistically understandable process, such that bad things happen to the wicked because of their sins, and good things happen to the righteous because of their merits. This is not how it is in Jesus' understanding of life in God. From the majority of his teachings, such as the parables, healings, and exorcisms, I would conclude rather that he taught that all things good and only things good came from the hand of the Father. But also that a great deal of other things that were hurtful, sorrowful, and downright evil also came upon suffering men and women 
through the abundant powers of darkness that surround us. Forces that were hostile to the peace and joy of the kingdom, which Jesus saw and had promised as imminent. But things nevertheless permitted out of the Father's philanthropy to exist and hurt us for the time being. Among the Orthodox teachers of the past, there were many who adopted the rather simplistic view of providence that bad things happened because of our sins. Perhaps not noticing that this was a view which Jesus himself explicitly rejects out of hand in the Gospels. But there is also a strong theme of ecclesiastical teaching that sufferings happen to us not only on account of specific assaults of evil against us, which is a theme strongly present in our sacramental rite of healing, but also because of our general fallen condition, since sinfulness has led our race into corruptibility and mortality and ignorance. As fallen humanity, we are now no more than, quote, a very strong fragility. And that is why we humans suffer in so many varying degrees and why we shall all one day die, however much we may pretend otherwise. Of course, this widespread avoidance technique is natural because sickness and death confuse our sense of that other equally graceful gift of the resurrection within our hearts, which tells us that the Lord's incarnation has already restored incorruptibility and immortality to us if we so choose to cling to him. Even so, a significant personal illness, a global pandemic, and most certainly the increasing effect of old age, reminding us that we have only a temporary residence visa on this earth. All of these things bring sharply before our minds this paradox of the Father's providence that the Lord himself had to wrestle with in Gethsemane. Most people, I suppose, will cast the paradox aside and continue pretending, even in time of pandemic, that nothing is seriously wrong as long as their immediate family doesn't catch anything. So the media confirms that the correct response to the problem, in Brit speak, is keep calm and carry on. A bit like Candide, isn't it? But the proper response is, as Queen Elizabeth reminded us, to turn to God in prayer. And I think our church would add to that, to turn in humble prayer in time of trouble and ask fervently for God's mercy, not just on us, but on all suffering peoples. So, from my first New Testament reflection, the opening thing I would say that we need to add to practicalities is this dimension of orientating ourselves to the spiritual reality of illness by repentant prayer. Repenting not for God to lift his oppressive and angry hand, since the evil does not emanate from him, but praying rather that we may be strengthened and comforted and made stable and joyful in the face of our present mortality. My second observation comes from a patristic base and reaffirms the main point. It is the consistent teaching of the great fathers that we stumble on through life through many sorrows, sufferings, and trials, but that we ought never to lose heart because of that mixed condition of our life. St. Gregory the theologian taught that there were three creations, the two understandable ones being that of the angels and that of the earth and animals alike. These two were entirely consistent in their constitutions, the mortal spirits entirely rational and free of material weakness, and on the other side, material things and life forms that are entirely absorbed by and contained within the limits of their earthly awareness. Put simply, by being ontologically consistent, angels do not suffer by virtue of their nature, 
not just stones, trees, or to an extent, even animals. Have you ever noticed how cats just go behind the sofa to die without any fuss? Or, if fatally attacked by a lion, a wildebeest expires very passively and relatively quickly. Their nature sends a termination message, and so it is done. But not so with us, by any means. Gregory said that the third creation was humanity, what he calls an incomprehensible mixture of the other two types of ontology. Why has God so mixed earthly nature with angelic sensibility in our state of life, Gregory asks. And he concludes, I cannot understand it, but it is the source of our suffering. This divinely appointed mixture of noetic sensibility and earthly mechanics makes us into an ontological one-off throughout the entire cosmos. At home, nowhere, and tied to a suffering consciousness, Gregory says, until such time as we shall be transfigured into angelic glory. But he saw that mixed ontology not simply as a cause of lament, but it also explained the unique destiny of humanity, our gift alone in all creation to rise out of and beyond our first nature into a potential for something transcendent and glorious. For Constantine's advisor, the Christian theologian Lactantius, that relationship with God and the sense of honor it affirms within the believer served to lift humans out of despondency, but to abandon the relationship by scorning prayer and worship was to destroy our very life force. He says that when humans imagine that there is no God who has any loving care for them, and there is no future life, humans go to pieces and delude themselves that hedonism will save them. He concludes his argument, and I quote, in short, we humans must learn to value ourselves highly and understand that there is more to the human being than ever appears to the eyes, since we cannot retain our power or our standing unless we set aside our wickedness and embrace the worship of our loving Father. Now, of course, if I did have to address the nation, I would not be using such a set of footnoted arguments. It could be no better phrased, however, than repeating the gospel that we have a beloved Father who looks after us with loving care, no matter what fate befalls us in life. And that if we understand we are creatures who share a destiny with the angels. We shall never fall to the level of a suffering animal or treat our brothers and sisters like animals, but instead will be moved to give them the care that is their due as sons and daughters of God. We do not have the expectation to be relieved of our sufferings as much as can be out of any supposed basis of human rights. We have it by divine right. And so, to the holy ministrations of the medical services must always be added compassionate support from those who understand the glorious worth of the suffering human being. My third and last remark is a simple pastoral one, but no less significant than those other theological arguments. Faced with suffering, either of illness, or bereavement, or other fearfulness and oppressions that so often afflict humanity. The Orthodox Church calls out to all believers to offer the profound balm of loving kindness, what it calls philanthropia, in remembrance of that love that God has first shown to us. After we have exhausted all the practical remedies we can suitably apply, having tried to share our resources, our gifts, our skills in the service of the suffering, a point of exhaustion, by the way, which will be much longer coming than perhaps we might have imagined, then even if we can do little more for a distressed person, 
the gift of sitting, to hold hands, a simple word of kindness and loving regard, a shared prayer, a quiet blessing. These are all things that are priceless, that can be given freely. They do not replace the practical necessities, for it is still important to follow Condide's advice and make sure we offer a sensible remedy. But these spiritual resources also serve to animate and illuminate that practical help offered to those in distress. As Maximus the Confessor said, these spiritual energies are sacraments of the presence of the Logos in the world, and they transfigure those who can and do offer them into being priests, mediating the Lord's presence in this cosmos. And in offering Christ's comfort to others, we also calm and strengthen our own souls in the process. I suppose that in our media-driven world, my message to the nation should have had a pithy synopsis to go with it as a press release. And so to end, I shall say it all again in one long sentence. To Voltaire's useful but insufficient adage that we must cultivate the garden, that is, do all that is practically required, wear masks, wash hands, avoid infection, stop selling wild animals in crowded meat markets, we also have to add in the equally necessary responses of praying for mercy with a repentant heart and serving as priests of Christ's gospel of compassion by each one of us sheltering little flames of love, even in those caves into which we have withdrawn and sharing them with those who are currently in distress. Thank you for your attention.